Hello, Year 5, and now I'm ready for Chapter 3 of Letters from the Lighthouse. Make sure you're sat somewhere comfy and I've got a nice drink with you to listen to Chapter 3. So this time it is called Mothers, Send Them Out of London. The following Wednesday, I was allowed home from hospital. There'd been no sign of Suki and it was strange coming back to our house and her not being here. In my darker moments, I began to wonder if mum was being realistic. Perhaps my sister was dead. Maybe mum knew and wasn't telling us. I watched her mood for changes, but the truth was she was always sad and nowadays it was so hard to tell. At a loss of what else to do, I decided to investigate the boyfriend possibility. Suki had obviously planned to meet someone that night, someone who she'd dressed up for, who should get, who'd given her a note. Perhaps it had been a love letter. Excited by my theory, I asked Cliff what he thought. Oh, a boyfriend? Love letters? That's disgusting, he said, making sick noises. So I didn't tell him what I found when, one afternoon as mum slept, I tiptoed into Suki's room and looked through her drawers. There were letters, loads of them tied up with ribbon and stuffed inside old chocolate boxes so they smelled of peppermint and toffee. All postmarked Devon. They were obvi obviously from her pen pal Queenie, though it wasn't these that caught my eye. Underneath the chocolate boxes was a map. On seeing it, my heart gave a peculiar thud. There wasn't time to read it properly. Hearing mum stir in the next room, I knew I'd better get out of there quick but not before I'd glimpsed a coastline and some foreign sounding names. I shut the door again, drawer again, feeling more confused, not less. Suki hadn't mentioned going away, nor had she told us about a boyfriend. Perhaps she'd gone somewhere to be romantic with him, though I couldn't think where. It was winter still, for starters, and people didn't go on holiday these days. That's what... People didn't go on holiday these days, not with the war on. Yet it gave me hope, thinking that's what she'd done, because holidays didn't last forever. People eventually had to come home. Later that day, Mum called Cliff and me to the kitchen. On the table stood two empty suitcases. Gloria from next door was sitting in a chair, drinking tea. Seeing my forehead, she gave a low whistle. Jeepers, Olive, that bruise is all colours of the rainbow. She's got concussion, Cliff said proudly had concussion i corrected him gloria winked at me don't you let jerry get away with it my girl make sure you give him what for jerry was what dad and his army pals used to call germans and little reminders like this often made me sad but it was hard to feel glum with gloria in our kitchen she was one of those big bright people you couldn't help but like whose throaty laugh made you smile she was mum's best friend and she'd become a sort of auntie to us, not having kids of her own or a husband. He ran off with the circus, she told me once. I didn't know if it was true. As mum moved about the kitchen making tea, I sat down next to Gloria. Do you know anything about Suki having a boyfriend? I asked her. She gave me a funny look, alarmed almost, before glancing over her shoulder at mum. Best not to mention your sister at the moment, she whispered, leaning towards me. Your mum's feeling fragile about the whole business. I sat back in my seat. It was then I properly took notice of the suitcases on the table. Cliff was clicking, clicking the catches and asking mum if we were going somewhere nice. Hopefully, mum twisted her reading ring, which meant she was nervous. After what happened to you, Olive, and to Suki, I've had to accept it's really not safe for you to stay on in London. Now I was nervous too because I'd guessed what the suitcases were for. You're evacuating us, aren't you? I said in surprise. But you can't, I mean, you need us here. We need to be here. That was always what mum said. We needed to be together, especially after dad went off to fight. When war was declared, all the schools round our way closed. Our classmates and our teacher, Miss Higgins, got evacuated to Kent, and for a while I'd get postcards from my friends, Maggie and Susan, who told me all about what I was missing, which wasn't much by the sound of it. You know the raids have got worse these last, these past few months, darling. Mum looked pained. It won't be forever, I promise. I felt guilty when Cliff seemed so excited. He was already lifting one of the suitcases down from the table and bombarding Mum with questions. We'll have to share a bedroom. 
Will the people we stay with be nice? I hope they've got a dog. Can we ask to be with the dog? I don't know, Mum kept saying. You'll have to wait and see. Yet how could we leave not knowing where Suki was? How could I find out about her boyfriend from somewhere deep in the countryside? It was infuriating and disheartening and made my head ache. Lots of children get sent away, Mum said, putting her arm round me. Some even have to move whole countries because of the war. You remember the kinder transport, don't you? I did, vaguely. A year or so ago at school, some children who couldn't speak English joined our class and we were amazed at how quickly they learned. They'd come over from Germany because, being Jewish, it wasn't safe for them there. Mum said they'd been blamed for all the bad things happening in their country, which was odd because lots of their parents were musicians and doctors and writers. You'd think their country would be proud of such clever people. So chin up, you won't be going too far, a train journey at most. Mum kissed the top of my head, then looked distant again. The most important thing is that you're safe. Are we going soon? I asked. Mum paused. First thing Monday, she replied. I bit my lip. That was only a few days away. Where are we going though? Cliff wanted to know. Gloria tapped the side of her nose. Leave that to me. Then her and Mum shared a meaningful look, the sort that adults do when they don't want you to understand. Cliff and me spent the weekend packing. Underclothes, nightclothes, sweaters, socks, toothbrushes, combs, though it still didn't seem right to be leaving. I couldn't deny the odd twinge of excitement. It had been quite boring, really, staying behind in London. The only people left on our street these days were babies, women and grumpy old men. There weren't even enough kids to play a game of hopscotch. I missed my classmates. There were even times when I'd missed going to school. Who knew where we'd be this time next week? Perhaps I'd make some new friends and Cliff might find himself a dog willing to sleep at the foot of his bed. Mum told me to limit the books I took. Just take three, she said. You won't be able to carry the case otherwise. But wanting all my favourites with me, I couldn't choose. So I packed five when she wasn't looking. I also took the sh seashell Dad had once given me. That sat on my window and had the sounds of waves in it when you put it to your ear. Once packed, we checked our things off from the list our local billeting of officer had given out and which had been unread in the kitchen drawer since the war began. The official in government information said we had to wear school uniform for our journey. After a year at the back of our wardrobe, Cliff's short trousers hung high above his knees and my pinafore would barely do up. There was also the question of my winter coat, which looked decidedly chabby, uh, shabby. I can't send you off looking like that, Mum said, eyeing me critically. You'd better have my smart one. It's decent and warm and it's silly not to make use of it. Even so, I almost didn't take it. The smell on the collar was Suki smell and it made a lump come to the back of my throat. Yet when I put the coat on and turned back, and turned back the cuffs a bit, I could almost imagine how she'd felt that night wearing it, strong and brave. By the time I went to bed on Sunday morning, I was almost looking forward to the morning. Chapter four, the roundup. Early Monday morning, we caught the bus to Paddington station. As was usual these days, I'd barely slept a wink. For once, though, there was a bit of good cheer in the air. And with the fish paste sandwiches Mum had made us for the journey, it felt almost like we were going on a day trip. Gloria, who'd come along to keep our spirits up, also had news to share. I've done a bit of asking about, she said, and managed to sort a very nice place down in Devon for you both to say. It's by the sea and... Are we going to save your sister? I blurted out. Mum rolled her eyes. Let her finish, Olive. It's all right, Gloria smiled. Yes, you're going to Queenie's. I grinned, delighted. This was good news because, being Suki's pen pal, Queenie might know something about her disappearance or be able to shed light on my boyfriend theory. She might even be able to explain about the map. Besides, going to stay with someone who knew my sister meant we'd not be living with a total stranger. I'd never met Queenie, but I knew she'd taken on running the village post office after her and, her and Gloria's parents died. 
She was only 19, so it was a big responsibility, but Gloria said that's what the war did to people. It made them grow up fast. What do you think, Cliff? I gave him an enthusiastic nudge. We're going to stay by the sea. He looked up from the Beano comic he was reading. Can you see the beach from the house? Better than that, Cliff. You can see the lighthouse, Gloria replied. Cliff and me shared an excited look. A lighthouse! Queenie's place is enormous. Attics, cellars, the works, Gloria went on. And it'll be nice to travel down with the other children being evacuated. Won't it, eh? Other children? This threw me, rather. I thought they'd all gone already. From your school, yes. A few schools stayed open in the other parts of the city. But it's got so bad lately they've been told to leave as soon as they can. The noise hit us the moment we left the bus. Coming from inside the station, it sounded like a school assembly, only 20 times louder. Even the loudspeaker making crackly announcements couldn't deaden the racket of hundreds of high-pitched voices all talking at once. Gosh, I gulped. That sounds like a lot of children. It will be fun for you, not being the only ones on the train, Mum said, straightening Cliff's collar. I wasn't so sure. More likely, it'd end up being an almighty crush, and I worried about losing Cliff in the crowds. This time, I'd make certain we didn't let go of each other. Inside the station, under the glass roof canopy, things got more overwhelming. A sea of different school hats, straw boaters, blue bowlers, woolly green berets, stretched as far as you can see. Being the only ones here from our school, we didn't have a teacher, so we stood near a group that did, hoping the billeting officer who was handing out labels would tell us what to do. I don't understand where I'm to tie it, said the girl in brown uniform. Her teacher looked ancient, at least 40, and was crochety, uh, crochety, crochety <laughs> in that way old people can be. Crotchety, that's what I meant. <laughs> was crotchety in the way that old people can be. Oh, for heaven's sake, Esther Jenkins, do listen to the instructions. The second his back was turned, the girl and her friends swapped labels. So Esther became Dorothy and Dorothy, whoever she was, became Mabel until the whole group was giggling. It was quite funny, really, except I was too on edge to laugh. Eventually, the billeting officer in her green army jacket and skirt reached us. Names, please, she said, checking her extremely long list. Olive and Cliff Bradshaw, staying with Queenie Pickering, Mum replied. Budmouth Point, that'll be Coach D, the woman said. Then to us, make sure you sit in the right coach, please. Mr Barrowman's going with you. When you get there, he'll be teaching you in the village school. Isn't that nice? I nodded, already anxious that I'd forgotten something she'd said. Cliff was gazing about him with eyes on stalks, so I knew he hadn't even he hadn't even been listening. Look lively, Olive, Mum said, jolting me from my thoughts. Put your name on the label. She dug a pencil out of her bag and I had to write my name, date of birth and home address. It was a brown card label with string attached, which I went to tie on my suitcase. No, Mum stopped me. It's got to go on you. Right above our heads, a loudspeaker sprang into life. Platform 12 for the 9.15 a.m. service to Penzance. Penzance. Platform 12, the train is ready for boarding. I had a feeling of wild terror that I wasn't ready. It was happening too fast. I wanted to stay longer to say our goodbyes, for it might be months be or months before we'd see Mum again. Now listen, darling, she said to me. You're to look after your brother, all right? I wasn't sure I was capable of even looking after myself, but I nodded wretchedly. I'll try my best. You'll be fine. You'll be together. She forced a smile. It made me sadder to think we were leaving her on her own, but her job was here in London. She had to work to pay the bills, so we'd still have a nice home to come back to when these awful air raids were over. The buzz of noise was becoming urgent. Children moved quickly now. Teachers were shouting. I pressed my hand to my stomach, feeling it churn with last minute nerves. Mum and me both spoke at once. That's your train. We'd better go. I hugged Gloria, who gave me a bag of toffees for the journey. I thanked her, then put my arms round Mum. Just a minute, 
Let me check you both, she said, pulling away. Taking out her hanky, she licked it, then wiped Cliff's cheeks, which he hated. Then she smoothed my fringe, even though it was already clipped aside. That's better. You're tidy, at least. I didn't want to look at her, but she took hold of my chin and gazed deep into my face. It was like she was trying to remember me, even though I was still there. Look after your brother. That's a good girl. Mum said again, sounding like she had a cold coming. Write to me, won't you? I nodded. Any news of Suki? Of course, Mum replied hastily. But try to put it from your mind, darling. Gloria, I noticed, was biting her lip. The left lipstick smears, it left lipstick smears on her teeth. Like they'd done it at home in our kitchen. Her and Mum shared one of those loaded grown-up looks. What it was all about, I didn't know. Nor was there time to ask. Our train was being called again and Cliff was hanging impatiently off my arm. <clears throat> Go on then, Mum said, giving me a gentle push. Stick together. You'll be all right. I took a big breath, like I was standing on the edge of a wall, trying to find the courage to jump. Come on, I said to Cliff, taking his hand properly. As soon as we started moving, the crowds that surrounded us buffeted us towards the train. When I looked over my shoulder, Mum and Gloria had gone. Most of the train doors were closed by now, though heads and arms still hung out of the windows. The guards strolling up and down the platform were telling everyone to take their seats. Coach D was divided into three big compartments. Each one was full, smelling of heaters on too high and damp, dusty clothes. Cliff looked like he might cry with disappointment. I wanted to sit by the window. I gave him a toffee and told him not to worry, though I honestly didn't think we'd get a seat at all. Making our way down the train, we stepped over sprawled legs and enormous pairs of feet. They were older kids than us, in uniforms of at least two or three different schools, who looked bored already and the journey hadn't even started. After searching the entire length of the carriage, we'd still not found a seat, so putting our cases down flat, I told Cliff to perch on top of them. <clears throat> I'd be all right leaning against the wall. At least that was the plan. Sitting down, Cliff had just opened his beano when a hand swooped in and grabbed it. Hey! Cliff looked up. Give that back, I cried. At eye level was a label saying Dorothy Roberts. The face above it belonged to that naughty girl, Esther Jenkins. Her hair was in two dark brown plaits, the pointed ends of which looked like they'd been sucked. She was holding Cliff's comic high above her head. It annoyed me that she'd taken it without asking. That's not yours, I said, reaching for it. It is now. I tried to make a lunge for the comic, but she was taller than me. I bought that for the journey, Cliff protested. Tough, Esther said. She spoke a bit oddly, using English words but sounding foreign. It's ours now. Before we could do anything, the comic got passed on to a boy, then another boy, before disappearing down the carriage. Esther patted Cliff on the head. Thanks, pal, before going back to her seat. Cliff's bottom lips started to quiver. Shh, don't cry, I said, putting my arm round his shoulders. We'll get it back. Shut up, Olive. Leave me alone. He turned away, burying his face in his arms. I didn't know what to do. There were no teachers on board to tell. Though through the window I saw the same old one out on the platform arguing with the guard. Suki, I knew, wouldn't stand her feeling useless. Even worse, Cliff, Cliff had started sobbing. I promised I'd look after him and I was doing a lousy job of it so far. Stay here, I said. Heading down the carriage, I soon found the Beano. Two girls were poring over a Dennis the Menace cartoon on the centre pages. Um, excuse me, I said, stopping politely at their seats. The girls kept their heads down. I tried again. I don't know if you realise, but that belongs to us. You can borrow it if you want when my brother's finished reading it. They ignored me. I felt rather stupid, especially when the boys in the next row started laughing and jeering, egging people on to join in until it spread through the whole carriage. Thoroughly flustered and wanting the whole thing just to be over, I tried to grab the comic again. The carriage fell silent. Standing in the doorway was a teacher, the one who'd been arguing on the platform. Now, it seemed, it was our turn. Carson, Mitchell, don't you know your alphabet? He barked. 
The girls reading Cliff's Fino jumped out of their skins. The comic slithered to the floor and I snatched it. You're supposed to be in Coach F, not this one, he yelled. I've spent the last ten minutes trying to sort out the confusion you've caused. But Mr. Barrowman, sir, one of the girls tried to speak. The teacher, our new teacher, I realised dismally, cut her dead. Each coach is for a different location, you foolish girls. This is Coach D going to, Gev to Devon. You're in Coach F, which will be going to hell and back if you're not careful. So move yourselves. You're holding up the whole train. Mortified, the girls rose out of their seats and got to their suitcases. The whole carriage watched without a word. I crept back up the aisle towards Cliff. You there, girl in the checked coat, Mr. Barrowman barked. I stopped. I turned around. Me? Which was a stupid thing to say since no one else was wearing a checked coat. Take these. He clipped his fingers at where the girls had been sat. Hurry up now. Cliff and me slid onto their still warm seats. Reunited with his Beano, my brother soon cheered up. But right in my eye line, just down the aisle, was the person who'd started it all. What are you looking at? Esther Jenkins mouthed. Dunno, hasn't got a, a label on it, I muttered to myself. Though like all of us, she had one swinging from her coat. I just hoped she'd lose interest in me once we got moving. Walking up the aisle, Mr Barrowman checked our names against his own shorter list and made Esther and Dorothy swap their labels. The moment he took his seat at the front, Esther Jenkins started on me again. You with the bruise on your forehead. I made a point of gazing out of the window. She didn't take the hint. You snitched on my friends, she said. They had to be, they had to move carriages because of you and now they won't be billeted with us. So I'd say that's your fault. It wasn't my fault. I knew it wasn't. I didn't make them sit in the wrong part of the train. I didn't snitch on them either. Yet Esther Jenkins blamed me and I felt hot and miserable with the injustice of it. Settling back in my seat, I consoled myself with two thoughts. Queenie at least would be kind and friendly and might know more than I did about where my sister was. Plus, I'd never seen a proper lighthouse before. So we've read chapter three and four there today. If you look on Teams, there is an assignment there with some Vipers questions for you to answer, just like last week. I look forward to seeing your responses and we'll start chapter five soon.